Welcome to Time for Hope, a faith-based mental health program. Join our host, certified clinical mental health counselor and Christian psychotherapist, Dr. Frida Cruz, and her guests as they discuss real life issues and offer expert clinical advice and solid biblical application for any and all life situations. Now here's the host of Time for Hope, Dr. Frida Cruz. Thanks for joining me and my guest for today, author, Christian apologist, and president of the Christian Research Institute, Hank Hanegraaff. Through his live call-in radio broadcast, Bible Answer Man, Hank equips Christians to read the Bible for all it's worth, answers questions on the basis of careful research and sound reasoning, plus interviews today's most significant leaders, apologists, and thinkers. I have the privilege today and next week of doing the interviewing as we discuss Hank's book titled Afterlife, What You Need to Know About Heaven, The Hereafter and Near-Death Experiences. I can assure you that you will want to stay with us. And Hank, it's great having you on Time for Hope. Well, thank you. It's good to be with you. Actually, you're so well known until I wondered when I asked if we were going to get to uh, have you on Time for Hope. But it's it's a great privilege. Well, it's nice. It's really nice to be with you. And it's also good that you didn't have to come so far. <laughs> so fairly short drive. Yeah, yeah. So many of my guests have to come from uh, California, you know, other great distances and yeah. uh, so forth. So, but you're right down the road in Charlotte. Indeed. Yeah, Charlotte's a great city, isn't it? It is. We've enjoyed, I have 12 children, and we have enjoyed raising our children in, uh, in Charlotte over the last few years. Yeah. My son looked up some information on you yesterday. He was uh, at lunch and noticed that you had, I think it was 10 children, the last account. Uh, <laughs> so you uh, we have 12. Yeah. have 12. Uh -huh. What are their ages? Well, the youngest is 9, and the oldest is 39. Oh. Yeah. That, uh, that's quite a range, uh -huh. uh, quite a range. So, but anyway, it, again, it's good to have you. you. And you've written on a very somber, sobering uh, subject when we think about uh, the way you start off the introduction, someday you will die. Yeah. Then what? Isn't it funny that we come into the world uh, and that's one of the first things that we become conscious of. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. When a woman gives birth, she gives birth to a body-soul unity. She doesn't just give birth to a body, but a body-soul unity. And at death, there's an unnatural rending of body and soul. The body goes back to the ground, it's buried, but the soul, absent the body, is present with the Lord. And Jesus gives a beautiful picture of that in Luke chapter 16, where there's a a beggar who dies, and the angels carry him to Abraham's bosom. And then the text tells us in the words of Jesus that he is comforted there. My dad died in 1997, and that's what he's experiencing right now. He's absent the body. He's present with the Lord. He's enjoying fellowship with the one who knit him together in his mother's womb. But the greatest of all eventualities is going to come when Jesus appears a second time, and then the soul returns to the body and the body is resurrected immortal, imperishable, incorruptible. That's our hope, isn't it? It is. And, you know, we have in nature a beautiful analogy for what happens to us. A butterfly once is a caterpillar, and then it weaves a chrysalis. A chrysalis is like a casket, and there its constituent parts devolve into a, a mysterious molecular mixture. And out of that mixture, comes an altogether other being. It's the same physically, but it's different organizationally. And that is how it will be with us. The DNA that makes you you is the DNA that will make you you for all eternity, but that DNA will be resurrected, immortal, imperishable, incorruptible, will be changed, 1 Corinthians 15 says, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So the Christian faith is not platonic. It's very physical. Our hope is in the physical resurrection just as Christ rose physically, we too will rise physically. I thought that was one of the best answers from the answer man that I found in your in your uh, book that I had not 
I had often wondered about about God bringing the body and soul back together, and to think of of it uh, being wrapped, especially when a body has been cremated or so forth. How how in the, you know it takes a lot to believe that God can and will do that. But when you brought in about that DNA, then it ma it made a lot of sense that um, you know that that. Uh, was not nothing's impossible with God anyway, but it, for some reason or other, it made more sense to me. Yeah, it's the blueprint. And so, when, when when you think about cremation or people that have died a long time ago, it's not that God resuscitates resuscitates every atom, it's that there's continuity between the body that was and the body that will be. So you think about the Mississippi River, for example. It's always the Mississippi River, although different water is flowing through it in a continuum. But it's the Mississippi River because there's continuity between the river bed and the water, and so it will be with our bodies. Our bodies will be resurrected in the sense that they will be what they would have been if sin had never entered the world. So you'll be the perfect you and I'll be the perfect me, which is to say our DNA will form to complete perfection and always be in that state of complete perfection because there's no devolution that takes place when the curse is removed. Beautiful. It makes me think about these aborted babies. Um, and you, of course you had not taken that up in your book, but uh, if they're that far along, as it were, uh, soon after they are conceived, then uh, they're, they're going to have a soul that exists forever? Yeah, absolutely, because the baby itself, a conceptus, has full personhood from the moment of conception. It doesn't have a fully developed personality, but it has full personhood. That means, again, when a woman gives birth, she doesn't give birth to only a body, but a body-soul unity. So what happens then is that body-soul unity, which did not have a time of development in this time-space continuum, will, in the new heavens and the new earth, develop to what that would person have would have been if they hadn't been aborted. That's uh, that. Uh, I, I know I lost two uh, babies, and so I'll be seeing two babies I've never seen when I get Absolutely. to heaven. Absolutely. I mean, that's the Are hope. Two, uh, uh, will they be adults, children? They, uh, they will develop to what they would have been had sin never entered the world. So they will develop to the flower of their youth. It's, you, you think about a, a tulip bulb and that tulip bulb opening up to complete perfection but never devolving, that is how it will be with humanity. According to a biblical worldview, we are going to develop to complete perfection without any devolution because we don't have in the new heavens or the new earth, we don't have the second law of thermodynamics. So there's not entropy, there's not the winding down or the devolution of the body. You and I are wearing out. I mean, the death rate is one per person, we're all going to face it, but in the new heavens and the new earth, we will be resurrected immortal, imperishable, incorruptible, very much like Jesus Christ rose. Jesus Christ is the earnest of our resurrection. If we would have been in the tomb when He rose from the dead, we would have seen dust fly off the very slab on which He lay. So our belief in a biblical worldview is the bodily resurrection. By the way, that's why we bury as opposed to cremate. Mm -hmm. God can raise the cremated, but cremation doesn't point to resurrection. Burial points to resurrection. It's an object lesson. So God uses physically, empirically perceptible events to give us a foretaste of eternal realities. Beautiful, just beautiful, and, and produces such joy. And uh, I know I was reflecting shortly after my husband's death, and <clears throat> I was looking out at the mountains and sitting there reflecting and thinking about where he was and what he might be doing and uh, what life would be like where he is. and. You've answered a lot of that in your book, by the way. And but I was uh, c carried away uh, with a, a sense of love, joy, and peace. Mm. If that's what I came up with, that if nothing else, he was he was in a place where he was experiencing love joy and peace. It's a state of being, yes. uh, not so much a place 
and you kind of bring that out in your book. Aren't that kind of on target here? Yeah, absolutely, because there's life after life, but there's also life after life after life. And what I mean by that is when you die now, so my dad died in 1997 as a classic case in point, absent the body, present with the Lord. But when Jesus appears a second time, then he will have life after life after life. In other words, the soul will then return to a resurrected body, but now he is experiencing fellowship with the Lord, which is what we are created for. When we were created, we were created with the Imago Dei or the image of God, which was tarnished in the fall, but it will be absolutely restored in the forever so that we will be able to enjoy fellowship with the Lord, the very thing that we were created for. Mm -hmm. So God- Ultimately, ultimately there'll be the body and soul joined, but you've got this interim uh, period uh, where I think it's nowhereness, uh, you well, refer yeah, the soul, to it. A soul uh, is non-physical, so it doesn't have extension in space. It doesn't have awareness, but it does have awareness. So it is enjoying fellowship with the Lord, but that soul one day will be restored to a physically resurrected body. That's the hope of the believer. As Christ rose, we too will rise. That's what animated Christians to be able to turn an empire upside down. They knew that someone could kill them physically, but they would live forever. The Lord said so, that. He said, don't worry about those that can take uh, destroy the body. Worry about those that um, can could destroy the soul. Both which, body and soul in hell, yeah, yes. Yeah. It, yeah, both body and soul in hell. So uh, when when I think about that, you're, you're talking about a transitional heaven, which I've always been taught and known, and it's stuck in my brain about it being paradise, uh, stuck off somewhere away from heaven, wherein we take on a temporary body. I don't know where all of this came from. You took that up really good, by the way. And I've often wondered about that. Why do we, you know? So I, I think I'm buying into what you teach uh, rather than what I have been taught, and probably most of our viewers have been taught that Paul taught. Uh, they they say Paul taught that we we take on an interim body of some kind between the time we die and the time Christ returns and wraps everything up, and we get our our forever body, our and our body and soul are uh, reunited and so forth. So, um, I uh, so again, I've I've understood what you're saying in your book, and yeah, and you have to test all things in light of Scripture and hold fast to the good. Yeah, hold fast to the good. Yes. It's they're telling me it's time for a break, and we'll uh, we'll come back and pick up with some more of this uh, these answers from you. Uh, and it is time for a break and we'll be right back. A person doesn't have to be religious to believe in heaven. When a loved one passes away, most people assume they have gone to heaven. Of course, believing that they have gone to a better place helps ease the grief of loss. New York Magazine contributing editor and Washington Post religion reporter Lisa Miller, author of a book titled Heaven, Our Enduring Fascination with the Afterlife, believes that the urge for heaven is universal, and this comes from knowing that sooner or later our life will end. And Sherwin B. Newland, author of How We Die, Reflections on Life's Final Chapter, relates so essentially we have to convince ourselves that there is an afterlife. Even those of us who don't believe in one sneakingly wish there was one. According to a recent survey by the True Life in God Foundation, 80% of Americans believe in heaven. To believe there is a heaven requires that we believe in life after death. Also, to believe in a literal heaven requires believing in a supreme being that has designed such a place. I suspect some persons that believe in heaven have not thought much about who created such a place. Once 
the reality that heaven didn't build itself is accepted, then one must confront the question of who did prepare such a place for us to inhabit after this life. The Holy Bible has the answer to this question. The first scripture in Genesis, the first book of the Bible records, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So if God created heaven, then that gives him the right to decide how we get to live there with him forever. Jesus Christ, the son of the creator God, knew a lot about heaven because he had lived there with his father from past eternity. He also knew how we can go to heaven and shared this information with his faithful disciples as he was preparing to return to his heavenly home. We read in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. I am going there to prepare a place for you. Doubting Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way. Everyone is not going to heaven when they die, only those whose passport is stamped with the blood of Jesus Christ. I always appreciate having you join us on Time for Hope. Our guest for today is Hank Hanegraaff, and we're talking about his book, Afterlife. And Hank, you used the butterfly uh, in, as an illustration in your book, and I've used it um, across this nation as an illustration also, but from a different perspective. I, I've taught uh, on, on suffering. Huh. Uh, I called it a theology of suffering, and I believe the three things that God has in mind when he allows us to go through periods of pain and suffering and affliction and uh, testing and so forth are outlined in Romans 5, mm -hmm. 3 through 5 and um, so forth. But anyway, there is the story of the monarch butterfly. And um, they, to be born or to come out of that cocoon, they have to go through a very, very, very narrow passage, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, so some people were watching this process and they thought they were gonna find a way to help the, the butterfly out. And, and so they slit the passage and let them out easier and they had no wings to fly. Yep. Because that narrow passage uh, is what pushes the fluid uh, into their wings mm -hmm. uh, that will enable them to fly when they emerge from that cocoon. Just like when we go through narrow passages yes. in life, God is doing something like that in our lives. It, it's performing a purpose. It's, uh, it's uh, growing us in Him, as it were, with that perseverance, that, those characterological changes and that hope uh, that we're told about in Romans. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, this is this is something that so few people grasp. It is in the cauldron of adversity and pain that God forges us into usable instruments for His kingdom. And the Bible never explains why. It doesn't answer the why question, but it teaches us to trust God in the midst of our wives. So you talked about losing your husband. I lost my father. We lost a preborn child. We lost a, a grandson. When you think about the death and the horror of death and separation, you want to immediately ask, why did that happen? But the Bible, again, doesn't answer the why question as much as it teaches us to trust God in the midst of our wives, because even in pain and suffering, as you point out so eloquently, he has a purpose. And Job uh, finally learned that, yes. although he yes. took uh, he took his own time and he uh, had a hard time uh, with it all to start with. But it says the latter end 
was better than 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 uh, than the beginning, and that's always good to remember, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you think about Job, God thunders back through the storm and says to Job, who is asking the why question, "You don't even know how I create a tiny drop of dew. How can you know what's going on in the heavenlies?" And so the the takeaway from all of that is Job repenting and recognizing, yes, though you slay me. Yet will I trust in you. I think it's so funny. I, um, in fact, I did a paper, a counseling paper on Job as I was doing my doctorate uh, at Trinity, and I had Dr. Gleason Archer. Uh, Can you yes. imagine having yes, him for wow. a professor? And uh, he gave me good marks, by the way. And they said you can't, you can't get good grades from Gleason. He's too <laughs> hard and that sort of stuff. But I came out okay uh, with it. But what I, I get a chuckle out of uh, Job saying, if I could only speak to you, God, if I could only speak to you, I could get this whole mess straightened out, you know, and then God suddenly appears. <laughs> he said, Job, when did I need you? Uh, you know, where were you when I made this great fish in the ocean? Where were you when I put the stars in the sky? Where were you? Uh, you know, what is it that you, that I needed you for, Job? Yeah. And then he changed uh, in his interaction. But he did tell Job early on, in which I liked. He said, okay, Job, here I am. Stand up and talk to me like a man. Yes. Man to man. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, the book of Job is a wonderful microcosm of, of, of life and our relationship with God. I mean, the ultimate thing that we are created for is to relate to the one who, who lets us know that there's not a single hair that falls from our head that he doesn't care about it. So he's intimately invested in every detail of our lives. And the beautiful story of Christianity is that Christ would suffer more than any man, more than the sufferings of all of humanity collectively so that we could be reconciled to our Creator, not only in time, but also for all eternity. Beautiful just beautiful and sometimes overwhelming. And in my devotionals as I'm spending time with the Lord, sometimes I am just totally overwhelmed with the sacrifice of Christ for, you know, and he would have had to do it for me if I'd have been the only, just the only one in the world that needed it. Uh, it would have had to be done uh, for me to have the hope. Uh, yeah, and it's not just about what happens when you die. It's about giving us life in the present. Christ came to give us life and to give it more abundantly so that we can experience Christ now. We can experience life. So it's not just doctrine that matters. It's life and doctrine. That's what Paul said to Timothy. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. I like what you're saying because I was going to ask you about that. After I finished studying and preparing and reading your book and that sort of stuff, I kind of thought, you know, why should we ever worry about anything? What does it amount to anyway when it's all, you know, everything's wrapped up and we get to be with the Lord forever? So what is life about, Hank? Well, life in the present is about experiencing God. It is about exercising those disciplines that Jesus Christ modeled during his earthly sojourn. Think, think about this. Dr. Luke says that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Why did he do that? Because he treasured fellowship with his heavenly Father. And it's the very thing that you're alluding to. When you were having your devotions, you were in awe experiencing Christ. And that is ultimately the end of humanity, to experience our Creator. You know what? I don't know if we're staying with your book or not. We're just getting uh, we're getting into it's all part uh, and parcel of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're getting into so much. But uh, I've got to share some things with our our viewers. But I want to come back. I want to come back to heaven. And um, we talked a little just briefly uh, about where we go when we die. Uh, we go immediately, and I want to leave this thought for this week with our viewers. We go immediately to be with the Lord. 
uh, it's just not in heaven, is it? Well, heaven is both a person and a place. So it is in heaven in the sense that we're experiencing God. But in terms of the restored universe, that's something we still long for and look forward to. So is it and a happens place, when Christ though? Is it a, a real place that we go to or is it... Uh, a spiritual uh, experience. Well, disembodied, the soul is with the Lord, and souls do not have awareness, but they have awareness. So they don't have extension in space, but as Paul says, we're in a disembodied state. We're absent the body, present with the Lord, and we're awaiting the greatest of eventualities when Jesus returns and the soul returns to the body. And then we will again be not only with God in the sense of a person, but then in the sense of a place as well. You answered that question rather uh, rather well, not knowing that I would ask such a question as that. So I'm going to turn to my viewers, and then we'll do a second show for uh, next week for them. And I have one that's, uh, uh, that a viewer has written. Dear Dr. Freedom, my wife died two years ago of cancer. I would like to know where my wife's spirit is. Has she gone to heaven or is she asleep? Also, I am struggling with why God took my wife. She was only 52. I am a new believer and am trying to sort this out. We have, be assured, we have prayed for you mm -hmm. and we do everyone and every prayer request that comes in to Time for Hope. And then I have a note of encouragement. Dear Dr. Frieda, I really love your mental health program. I hope it runs for many years to come. Well, you're not the only one. I do too. Thank you for having Time for Hope on the air and I greatly appreciate that. It uh, There's a lot of work. Uh, I have a great staff and the Lord provides. So um, I'm thankful also for having Time for Hope on the air. A free fact sheet that contains additional information about today's topic is available upon request from our ministry. You can also receive a copy of today's resource for a contribution of any amount to the Time for Hope ministry. To receive our free fact sheet, or our guest book, or both, you may call us at 800-669-9133. Write us at Post Office Box 2169, Spartanburg, South Carolina, 29304, or visit our website at timeforhope.org. When you call or write, prayerfully consider a donation to our ministry. Our ministry's mission is to offer hope to discouraged and hurting people. As we continue to give out messages of hope, a financial gift of any amount to support this ministry will be greatly appreciated. When you do this, you are joining us in offering hope to many viewers seeking help and hope for their situation. This will also enable us to inform and inspire some viewers to expand our mission as they learn and in turn can minister more effectively to hurting people around them. To see this program again online, go to our website, or search for Time for Hope TV on YouTube, iTunes, and Facebook. Until next time, have a great week. And remember, it is Time for Hope.